Thank you so much for joining me once again for our reading of this article from TrinityTruth.org. And our reading for today is entitled, When and How Was Jesus Born from the Father? Before I do share with you this article, I would like to invite you for a word of prayer. Um, let us bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, the almighty God, the only true living God who gave his only begotten son, I'm grateful once again for this opportunity to share this article. May we continue to study the things that are revealed to us only through your son's name, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. The article subtitle, When and How Was Jesus Born from the Father? Some say Jesus is being continually born of God in the days of eternity based on Psalm chapter 2 verse 7, which says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. But it is prophesying of a future event and does not say that. And that's not say that. Acts 13 verse, verse 33 exclaims, explains, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, this day have I begotten you. In the significant passage of Acts 13, 16 to 41, Paul tells the story of the Lord and Savior and how he came and died for our sins, but was raised from the dead by his father in heaven and did not see corruption. Thus, this passage declares it was fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. He was born from the dead and God was raised, who raised him, demonstrating that he was his son. This is also supported by Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. So when does the Bible say Christ was brought forth or born from the Father? Proverbs chapter 8 verses 23 to 26 says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Verse 24, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, 26, while as he had made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. So Christ was brought forth from the Father before the earth was created in the days of eternity. And of course, if Christ was brought forth, then this also confirms Father before the earth was created in the days of eternity. And of course, I'm sorry, if Christ was brought forth, then this also confirms his personality as an origin. Note that the Hebrew word olam used for everlasting in verse 23 in the King James Version Bible has several possible meanings and has been translated in mainly different ways according to context and what the translators believe to be correct. It can mean the vanishing point, time out of hand, past or future ancient time, and beginning of the world, to name a few. Here are some other translations that demonstrates this point. All Proverbs 23, CJV, I was appointed before the world, before the star, from the earth's beginnings. HCSB, I was formed before ancient times, from the beginning, before the earth began. NLT, I, I was appointed in ages past, at the very first, before the earth began. And LV, I was set apart long ago from the beginning before the earth was. RSV, ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. Who does 
wisdom refers to in Proverbs 8. Since, since some say this does not refer to Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 to 30. But unto them, which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. But to of him are ye in Christ, Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Wisdom in the following verse also refers to Christ. Luke chapter 11, verse 49. Therefore, also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles. For Adventist, through Solomon, Christ declared, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning, or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Alan G. White, Science of the Times, August 29, 1900. Some also have the wrong concept of the wrong beginning in Scripture. God, of course, had no beginning in the word. Beginning means the origin and source of something. One example from the Oxford Dictionary for beginning is the background of origins or of a person or organization. If Christ was co-eternal with the Father, then like his Father, he would have no beginning. The Septuagint that Jesus quoted from says, He established me in the beginning, before time was, before he made the earth. So all the translations of Proverbs 8.23, in fact, actually say Christ has an origin. Solomon has used Hebrew parallelism in verse 23, which expresses a thought one way and then uses a complementary thought to express it another way. So the last two phrases of this verse are saying the same thing as the first phrase, but in a different way. This gives tremendous clarity on when he is referring to, and yet most still get it wrong. Bible writers did not understand science as we do and measured time by the spears in the skies, and that did not exist until Christ created everything. So Christ was established in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, before he made the earth, which was before time was, since there was nothing to measure time by yet. Thus we know that the beginning was when the earth was made, where there was nothing in existence to measure time by, and hence was before time was. And so the phrases from eternity, from everlasting, before time was, the days of eternity, from the beginning, and before the earth was, all mean the same thing. Quite simply, before the earth and things were created, Micah 5.2 also informs, informs us that Christ is an origin and was brought forth a long time ago. It also uses the Hebrew word olam as Proverbs 8.23 and has the same translation issue. The phrase going forth in the King James Version implies an origin, of course, and why the NIV used the words origins. Micah 5, verse 2, King James Version, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, through, through you, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth had been from old, from everlasting. The same verse, Micah 5, 2, NIV, But you, brethren Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Some had mistaken the words, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. In Hebrews 1, 8, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, to mean his throne has always existed. But it uses the same Greek words as Revelation 22, verse 5. In regards to, to forever and ever, and both refer to forward in time, unless, of course, we have always existed. The NIV is clearer as it says, your throne of God will last forever and ever. For Adventist, and although we may try to reason in regard to our creator, how long he, Christ, has had existence, where evil first entered into our world, and all these things, we may reason about them until we fall down faint and exhausted with research when there is yet an infinity beyond. Ellen G. White, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 919, Paragraph 5. 
There was a time when Christ proceeded forth and came from God, from the bosom of the Father, John 8, 42, chapter 1, verse 18. But that time was so far back in the days of eternity that to finite comprehension, it is practically without beginning. And E.G. Wagoner, C.H.R., page 21, 1890. Thus, Ellen White and Wagoner says that Christ was brought forth from God a very long time ago. Christ was the Son of God before he was sent to earth and was tore from the bosom of his Father. The Eternal Father, the Unchangeable One, gave his only Son, that gave his only begotten Son, tore from his bosom, whom him who was made in the express image of this of his person and sent him down to earth to reveal how greatly he loved mankind. Alan G. White, Review and Herald, July 9, 1895. Note that the nature of God and his only begotten son is actually illustrated in a small scale with Adam and Eve. Adam and enjoyed the companionship of God and of all the angels. Love, gratitude, loyalty of the creator. All were overborne by love to Eve. She was a part of himself. Alan G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 56, paragraph 2. In exactly the same way Eve was part of Adam, Christ is part of God. God's love for the world was not manifest because he sent his son, but because he loved the world, he sent his son into the world that divinity clothed with humanity might touch humanity. While divinity lay hold of infinity, though sin had produced a gulf between man and his God, divine benevolence provided a plan to bridge that gulf. And what material did he use? A part of himself. The brightness of the Father's glory came to a world all seared and marred with a curse. And his own divine character, in his own divine body, bridged the gulf and opened the channel of communication between God and man. Alan White, letter 36A, September 18, 1890. So we find that Christ was tore from the bosom of his father and hence was part of himself, which is something a Trinitarian can never say. The Son of God was brought forth from the father and hence is the same substance of his father. This, this means that everything Christ consists of has always existed as it came from the father. But the person of Christ had a beginning, even though what Christ consists of does not. Thus, it would not necessarily be incorrect to say that Christ has always existed before. He was born from the perspective that he existed in the bosom of his father. May you continue to examine and study this for yourselves. May God the Father and his only begotten son, tore, torn from his bosom, a part of himself, gave his only begotten son to die for you and for